and Government Affairs Committee will come to order. We welcome everyone here. We have a tight time frame because of other proceedings in the Senate. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for being here and their cooperation and thank the ranking member for his cooperation and other members of the committee who are here today. Uh, our purpose today is to hear from whistleblowers who have personal eyewitness factual stories to tell about Boeing putting profits ahead of safety, putting stock price ahead of quality, production speed ahead of responsibility. This story is serious, even shocking. The kinds of evidence that we will hear today is fact-based, science-based testimony that the public deserves to hear. And it is part of a continuing series of hearings that we will have based on what these whistleblowers will tell us and evidence that we obtain from documents from a variety of sources. There are mounting serious allegations that Boeing has a broken safety culture and a set of practices that are unacceptable. These whistleblowers have come forward at great personal risk. In fact, a number of them and others have suffered harassment, isolation, transfers, and even threats of physical violence. Just as an example, this tire was in a car that belonged to Mr. Salpour. He will testify about the circumstances that led to, in effect, a bolt being driven into a tire in his car, which posed not only a symbolic message to him, but also a personal risk to his safety. It is simply one example of retaliation and reprisals and threats that he endured. Boeing is at a moment of reckoning. It's a moment many years in the making. It is a moment that results not from one incident or one flight or one plane or one plan. It reached the public consciousness after the death of 346 people, 346 innocent travelers in 2018 and 2019 that led Boeing to promise that it would overhaul its safety practices and culture. That promise proved empty. We know it was empty because of incidents that have occurred since then, most recently the Alaska Airlines panel blowout. We know it was empty because the FAA itself audited Boeing's production and manufacturing and in March concluded, quote, noncompliance issue in Boeing's manufacturing process control, parts handling and storage and product control, end quote, were prevalent. I want to welcome particularly Sam Salapur, who came to us because of the gravity of his concerns and because of what happened to him when he tried to raise these concerns to Boeing's management, not once, twice, but consistently and constantly over a period of years. And as a result, he was isolated, transferred, even threatened for refusing to stay silent. What Boeing did was, in effect, try to silence him, conceal and cover up the facts that he was trying to bring to their attention about basic defects in manufacturing, the failure to properly fuse fuselage parts, the kind of concerns that led to the 
blowout of that panel on the Alaska Airlines flight. In the wake of the 737 MAX crashes, many current and former Boeing and FAA officials like Ed Pearson and Joe Jacobson, both of whom are with us today, came forward to raise those kinds of concern about safety culture at Boeing. And tragically, last month, John Barnett, a former Boeing quality control manager in South Carolina, who became a whistleblower, committed suicide after alleging that managers had been pressuring workers not to document defects and properly address safety risks. Since this hearing was announced, our subcommittee has received outreach from other individuals affiliated with Boeing who have contacted us to voice their concerns. For example, a, Boeing, a former Boeing South Carolina manager wrote to us with examples of what he described as, quote, culture of shortcuts, pressure, and hostility that he experienced while working at Boeing between 2009 and 2020. Another Boeing mechanic who asked to remain anonymous wrote to us and said, quote, the Boeing South Carolina plant was run by a good old boy network that played by their own rules. When we raised concerns that the work was not in accordance with the process and procedures, we were ordered to just do it and told there were hundreds of others waiting in line outside the gate, wanting our jobs. I'm going to ask without objection that these two letters be entered into the record. The outreach that we've received, important and serious contacts with substantive information, in just the last few days suggests that there may be others out there who live in fear, like Mr. Salapur, like John Barnett, at the, and they have witnessed the shortcuts or defects that could lead to the next tragedy. And their coming forward may help prevent it. To Mr. Salabor, to Mr. Pearson, to Mr. Jacobson, and others who have come forward and will come forward in the future, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for speaking truth to power in the best sense of that word. Thank you for facing down one of the most powerful companies in the world. We intend to uncover what has enabled the culture of safety disregard to exist so that we can change it for good. To create a genuine and comprehensive culture of safety, Boeing must create workplace conditions where everyone feels comfortable reporting quality and safety concerns, even in situations where concerns to be, turn out to be unfounded, even where the complaints are mistaken. Boeing's culture must be one where employees are encouraged to speak up. Boeing is fortunate to have one of the most skilled, competent, honest, dedicated workforces in the world. The United States is fortunate to have them working at Boeing. They deserve to be rewarded, not punished for doing their job properly and speaking up when it's appropriate. Fortunately for Boeing and for passengers around the world, this moment of reckoning and the changes that must follow can still happen before any more lives are lost. Our committee has initiated a bipartisan inquiry. We expect both Boeing and the FAA to fully cooperate and appear before our committee. Today's hearing, as I mentioned earlier, is the first of several we intend to hold to get to the bottom of Boeing's broken safety culture. We expect Boeing CEO 
to appear before us to tell the American people why the promises made five years ago by this company have not been fulfilled. I don't want anyone to mistake our objectives here. Our goal is not to drive Boeing to fail. In fact, just the opposite. We want and need Boeing to succeed. It is a company that once was preeminent in engineering and safety. We want to restore the luster of that reputation and its business, which have been so sadly battered. Boeing's workers remain as skilled and talented as ever, and I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize that many of these workers are represented by unions, like the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, and the Society of Professional Engineering Employees in Aerospace, and they have helped to protect a number of their employees against retaliation and reprisal. We want Boeing to learn from its mistakes and be accountable. We want the Department of Justice to take this evidence and other facts that it has obtained to examine the deferred prosecution agreement, whether conditions of that agreement have been violated, whether criminal prosecution is appropriate. I'm not drum jumping to conclusions. I'm a former prosecutor. I know that investigations have to proceed carefully and methodically. But these investigations are important to accountability. Again, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. And I turn now to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also want to start by thanking our witnesses, uh, your courage in coming forward as whistleblowers. Um, I, I want to uh, underscore what you did say, that this, this is a, we, we all want Boeing to succeed. Uh, I would ask that my uh, written opening statement be entered in the record. Um, yeah, prior to this hearing, I, I talked to stakeholders. I talked to airlines, your Boeing's customers. I talked to Boeing representatives. Um, it was a overall theme that everybody wants Boeing to succeed. We need them to succeed because as a traveling public, we want to feel safe in the air. And I, I think I enter this investigation acknowledging the fact that airline travel is still probably the safest way to travel. It's, it's what I keep telling myself when I, when I hop on an airplane and even when I hop on a 737 MAX, it's been taken care of. Um, we need more whistleblowers. Not only in Boeing, but we need them in the airline, in their maintenance departments. We need whistleblowers from the FAA. This is a very complex business. They're complex products. It's a complex problem. And so I appreciate this hearing. I I'm a little concerned. What I, what I don't want this committee to do is scare the you-know-what out of the American public. In the end, I want the public to be confident in getting on an airplane and, and uh, uh, experiencing air travel. But I have to admit, this testimony is more than troubling. And as I was reading the testimony last night, as I've read more things this morning, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to enter an article that I was given to this morning written in, on April 3rd in City Journal. Uh, the title is, An Insider Explains What Has Gone Disastrously Wrong with Boeing. Um, we have to be concerned about what's happening. And we've got to get to the bottom of this. Is this, this is going to take a lot of work. This is going to take a lot of investigation. And, and again, we, we, need, we need to hold these hearings, but we need to do the detailed work. And we need more information. We need people coming forward on all sides, OK? Uh, but, but I do want to just quote from this article. Um, it's, it's an interview with an insider, a whistleblower that's not coming public. But he tells a story of, an elite dysfun of elite dysfunction, financial abstraction, and DEI bureaucracy that has poisoned the culture, creating a sense of profound alienation between the people who occupy the executive suite and those who build airplanes. It uh, goes on. Right now, we have an executive council running the company, Boeing, that is all outsiders. The current CEO is a General Electric guy, as is the CEO, CFO who we brought in. We have a completely new HR leader with no background at Boeing. 
The head of our commercial airplanes unit in Seattle, who was fired last week, was one of the last engineers in the executive council. The headquarters in Arlington is empty. Nobody lives there. This is an empty executive suite. The CEO lives in New Hampshire. The CFO lives in Connecticut. The head of HR lives in Orlando. We just instituted a policy that everyone has to come to work five days a week except the executive council, which can use private jets to travel to meetings. And that is the story. It's a company that is under caretakers. It's not under owners, and it's not under people who love airlines. In this business, the workforce knows if you love the thing you are building or if it's just another set of assets to you. At some point, you cannot recover that process uh, or recover with that with process. You cannot recover with process what you have lost with love. And I think is, is probably the most important story of all. There's no visible center of the company, and the people are wondering what they're connected to. Now, again, I read this this morning after having read the troubling testimony. Um, there's some real problems at Boeing that need to be fixed, and I'm not exactly sure how they're going to get fixed, but again, this, this investigation has to include not only Boeing, it's got to include how airlines maintain Boeing products, but it's also got to look at the FAA and, and government and you know, where, we have, where government has potentially uh, dropped the ball as well. So again, th this is going to be, this has to be a detailed investigation, and the end result has to be toward helping Boeing succeed by exposing the truth. So again, I, I, I appreciate the hearing, um, and I'm looking forward to the witnesses, and again, thank them for their participation. Thank you very much, Senator Johnson. I think you've heard bipartisan accord on the direction we're going to take, and I want to introduce the witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, Sam Salapur, current quality engineer at Boeing, is a, a person with four decades of aerospace experience, including work as an aerospace engineer for a NASA contractor and 17 years as an engineer at Boeing. In his role at Boeing, he monitors production, analyzes defects, and develops strategies to prevent the kinds of incidents that we've seen from reoccurring. Mr. Salabor has come forward to our subcommittee after documenting years of safety concerns while working on the 777 and the 787 aircraft. Ed Pearson, Executive Director of the Foundation for Aviation Safety and a former Boeing manager. Mr. Pearson is a former senior manager and the current Executive Director of the Foundation for Aviation Safety. He spent 10 years at Boeing and oversaw teams who manufactured Boeing's 737 MAX airplanes. Prior to joining Boeing, Mr. Pearson spent over 30 years in the United States Navy. I believe you're a graduate of the Naval Academy. Joe Jacobson. Mr. Jacobson is a safety and aerospace engineer who spent more than 25 years at the FAA. He retired in 2021. Prior to joining the FAA, he was an engineer at Boeing for 11 years. He now serves as a technical advisor to the Foundation for Aviation Safety. Dr. Sean Puchnicki, uh, he has a PhD. He's a professional practice assistant professor for integrated systems engineering at Ohio State University. Uh, he is also an aviation safety consultant. He has served as an aviation accident investigator and he's a former commercial airline pilot. Uh, as is our custom, I will uh, swear you in, and then we'll hear your individual testimony. If you would please rise. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Mr. Salapur, uh, you may begin. Thank you. Chairman Blumenthal, our ranking member Johnson, and the honorable members of this subcommittee, thank you for convening this hearing. My name is Sam Salapur, and I'm a quality engineer at the Boeing. I have over 40 years of I have over 40 years of experience as an engineer. 
I'm not here today because I want to be here. I'm here today because I felt that I must come forward because I do not want to see another 787. I do not want to see 787 or 777 crash. I have serious concerns about the safety of the 787 and 777 aircraft, and I'm willing to take on professional risk to talk about them. First, a little, little bit about me. I came to United States in 1973 and got a mechanical engineering degree from University of Missouri, where Senator Hawley is from. After that, I worked in com for companies that they were involved in the space shuttle. I had a friend, engineer, that worked on the space shuttle. He was always complaining about the quality of the O-rings that we had uh, in the uh, space shuttle Sararaka boosters. He was scared that they might not they might fail. He raised his concerns, and he was heard, and uh, he wasn't heard, and uh, seven brave astronauts, including the teacher in space, died when the Challenger O-rings ultimately failed, just as he predicted. At the moment, I know that if I were ever in a similar situation, I would have to come up and speak up. I have analyzed Boeing's own data to conclude that the company is taking manufacturing shortcuts on the 787 program that may significantly reduce the airplane safety and the life cycle. Since 2013, there have been serious issues on the 787 program not properly closing thousands of gaps in its assembly of the fuselage on major joints. Boeing's standard says that these joint, these gaps must be closed, usually by a small shim or filler called a shim when they exceed uh, five thousandths of an inch. This seems very small. Boeing's PR team like to call it uh, the width of a human hair when you are operating at 35,000 feet. Details are that the size of a human hair can be a matter of a life and death. In a rush to address the, its bottlenecks in production, Boeing hit problems, pushing pieces together with excessive force to make him appear that the gaps don't exist even though they exist. The gap didn't actually go away, and this may result in premature fatigue failure. Effectively, they are putting out defective airplanes. I, re I, I repeatedly produced reports for my supervisors and Boeing management demonstrating that the gaps in the 787 not being properly measured or shimmed in two major joints of the 787. Evaluating from, Boeing, from the 29 inspected airplane data, I found gaps exceeding the specification that were not properly addressed 98.7% of the time. I want to repeat that. 98.7% of the time, the gaps that they were supposed to be shimmed, they were not shimmed. The other issue that I found when you have these gaps you, and you drill through them, you get some debris in the stack ups. This is known to be a problem, you know, not a good thing for the airplanes by Boeing. But Boeing data also, you know, from the inspection of the data shows that the debris ended up in the gaps 80% of the time. Again, you know, you have uh, debris in the gaps 80% of the time. I want to make clear that I have raised these issues over three years. I was ignored. I was told not to create, not to create delays. I was told, frankly, to shut up. At one point, Boeing management got sick of me and raising these issues and moved me out of the 787 program into this 777 program. On the 777 program, I found problems again. I found that Boeing started a new process to build the airplane without taking into the consideration of the design of the airplane and how the airplane was designed. As a result, I witnessed severe misalignment when the planes were assembled. Boeing manufacturing used unmeasured and unlimited amount of force to correct the misalignment. And this also weakened the, weakens the airplane in the long run. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. I call it the Tarzan effect, among other improper methods. Again, I raised concerns internally. I was sidelined. I was told to shut up. I received physical threats. My, 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 my boss said, I would have killed someone who said what you said in a meeting. And then 
This is not a safety culture when you get threatened by bringing issues of safety concerns. I hope that your work on this issue signals the Boeing that they must make real changes and get back to building their airplane safely. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Salapur. Mr. Pearson. Chair Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, distinguished members of the committee, good morning. Thank you for inviting me today. My name is Ed Pearson. My father was a Washington, D.C. homicide detective, and my mom was a nurse. I learned the importance of telling the truth from them, my teachers and coaches, and this was reinforced at the Naval Academy. The military, like all high hazard jobs, demands that people tell the truth and admit their mistakes, because if you don't, people will die. Since the first Boeing Max airplane crash, I've spent every day thinking about the victims, their families, and the millions of people that fly Boeing airplanes. I've done everything I can to continue telling the world the MAX airplane is still unsafe and to alert authorities to Boeing's dangerous manufacturing. I'm here today to share four key messages. First, the manufacturing conditions that led to the two 737 MAX disasters also led to the Alaskan accident, blowout accident, and these conditions continue. In 2019, I testified as a Boeing whistleblower. I had previously warned the 737 general manager before the MAX crash to shut down the factory. I also warned Boeing's general counsels, the CEO, and the board of directors before the second crash to shut it down. They ignored my warnings. During my 2019 testimony, I described the chaotic manufacturing, the dysfunctional safety culture, and the horrible job government authorities were doing investigating the two crashes. The world is shocked to learn about Boeing's current production quality issues. I'm not surprised because nothing changed after the two crashes. There was no accountability. Not a single person from Boeing went to jail. Hundreds of people died, and there's been no justice. Unless action is taken and leaders are held accountable, every person stepping aboard a Boeing airplane is at risk. Government authorities ignored Boeing's manufacturing problems until the Alaska accident. Passengers shouldn't have to rely on whistleblowers to provide the truth. They should be able to get on airplanes and not have to worry about what model it is, whether it was designed and manufactured to the highest of standards, whether the airline is operating and maintaining it properly, or whether government agencies are providing proper oversight. FAA, DOT, and NTSB leaders, NTSB leaders frequently state our aviation system is the gold standard. There's a reason commercial aviation has been historically safe, and that's because people worked extremely hard for decades to keep them safe. They told the truth, they admitted their mistakes, and they didn't downplay safety incidents. These agencies have become lazy, complacent, and reactive. The deterioration has been occurring over several years. My second point is the gold standard is now fool's gold. Because the only thing that is more dangerous than a dangerous environment is the illusion of a safe environment. Two brand new airplanes crashed after exhibiting production-related electrical and electronic defects within their first month of operation, and the NTSB did not investigate the factory. The evidence indicates the MAX crashes were triggered by manufacturing defects, not MCAS software. The NTSB is investigating the factory now. However, the reality is the NTSB is overly dependent on Boeing and the FAA to provide technical assistance in their accident investigations. They are not an independent investigative authority. There is an inherent conflict of interest. The Department of Transportation has been completely useless in helping the FAA do their jobs. They have continued to take a hands-off approach to this entire matter. My third point is, if the leaders of those government authorities, government agencies, had done their jobs, investigators would have uncovered a mountain of important information. The FAA would have known Boeing's production processes were a mess and the safety culture was terrible. The FAA could have prevented an ever-increasing list of production quality defects. Instead, they're surprised each time it occurs, showing how ineffective and reactive their oversight has become. Just last month, the FAA reported on uncommanded rolls of MAX airplanes due to wiring that is being chafed. Boeing and the FAA have known about these manufacturing defects for more than two years and did not inform the public about this potentially catastrophic condition. There are also Canadian reports of new MAX airplanes with chafe wire bundles containing burn marks and evidence of electrical arcing. Routine, excuse me, Boeing routinely states that their airplanes meet or exceed all safety standards. This is untrue 
and misrepresents the safety of the airplanes. The company illegally removed thousands of quality control inspections on individual airplanes without the FAA's knowledge and without the knowledge of the airlines. Although many of these inspections have been reinstated, hundreds of airplanes have left Boeing factories without those thousands of inspections. My last point is the Department of Justice and FBI relied on the slanted results of the first max accident investigation to develop an illegal and unjust deferred prosecution agreement. The NTSB chair reiterated to Congress last week that Boeing has said there are no records documenting the removal of the Alaska Airlines door. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, this is a criminal cover-up. Records do in fact exist. I know this because I've personally passed them to the FBI. A, few, a five minute testimony is not nearly enough time to explain how insidious the story is. Boeing's corporate leaders continue to conceal the truth. They continue to mislead and deceive the public about the safety of the planes. That is the safety culture at the top of the Boeing company right now. The good news is the employees of Boeing and these agencies can overcome poor leadership. We need them to be successful. They're highly capable. They need to be supported and encouraged. And these problems are fixable, but it starts with telling the truth. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pearson. Uh, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, Senators. Uh, my name is Joe Jacobson. I'm an aerospace engineer with almost 40 years of experience. I worked for Boeing from 1984 to 1995 on the 767 and 777 programs. From 1995 to 2021, I worked in aircraft certification at the FAA. I retired from the FAA in 2021 and have been volunteering as an independent aviation safety advocate since, mostly in support of the ET-302 families. On November 6, 2018, a week after the Lion Air 610 crash, I received an email from a colleague asking if we had done any issue papers on MCAS. This was the first day that I heard about MCAS. The next day, although not assigned to the crash investigation, I received an email from a colleague at the FAA which contained flight data recorder information from the Lion Air crash. It was immediately obvious to me that the 737 MAX had a serious design flaw. I saw that the horizontal stabilizer was repeatedly moving at a high rate because of a faulty angle of attack input. I guessed that a software error was responsible. A few days later, I was shocked to discover that the airplane was purposely designed and certified to use just one AOA input for this flight critical function. When the House report was released in September of 2020, I finally understood why I hadn't known about MCAS. Boeing meeting minutes from June 2013 recorded the reason, saying, if we emphasize MCAS is a new function, there may be a greater certification and training impact. Boeing intentionally hid the design from FAA engineers and airline pilots. Had we known, at least a half dozen experienced FAA engineers in Seattle, in the Seattle office, would have immediately rejected the original MCAS design. Boeing concealment led to two crashes and 346 deaths. After working on the recertification of the MAX after the second crash, I sent a letter to the parents of Samia Stumo shortly before my retirement in March of 2021. I saw their anger and grief and wanted them to know the true story and not the false narrative pr presented by Boeing and FAA. Over the last three years, Samia's parents have connected me with many other crash families. I frequently communicate with the devastated people who have lost loved ones in the ET-302 crash. I've heard many inspiring stories about those who were lost. Stories about Samia, Mick, Camille, Melvin, Bennett, Danielle, Graziella, and others. The recertification of the MAX has been characterized as the most comprehensive in the history of aviation. This is also a false narrative. During the recertification, of the MAX, FAA leadership supported Boeing's effort to narrow the scope to primarily focus on MCAS. MCAS was a mess for sure, but other critical items were off the re-examination table. The MAX crew alerting system doesn't meet current design requirements, and by my count, the old standard has contributed to eight fatal crashes of Boeing aircraft and 885 deaths since 1996. 
despite this dismal safety record, in July 2022, Boeing Chief Safety Officer Mike Delaney stated, I personally have no belief that there's any value in changing the 737. CEO Dave Calhoun lobbied further and said, this is a risk I'm willing to take. If I lose the fight, I lose the fight. Boeing lobbying efforts ultimately succeeded. The grandfathered design of this MAX leaves many vulnerabilities. When combined with a failure to investigate the manufacturing chaos identified nearly six years ago by Ed Pearson, this has led to a predictable but still shocking list of unsafe conditions. I've spent almost 40 years studying and trying to eliminate aviation accidents, ignoring problems, taking shortcuts, and deceiving the public just leads to more crashes. I'm testifying today out of my great love and respect for the crash family members that I know. Michael, Nadia, Nisha, Catherine, Ike, Chris, Javier, and others don't want this to happen to anyone else. I also have children and grandchildren. Let's work together to fix this now. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pearson. Mr. Puczynski, Professor. Chairman Bartholomew, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm an assistant professor in both Integrated Systems Engineering and the Center for Aviation Studies at The Ohio State University. Prior to teaching at Ohio State, I was an airline pilot. During my time teaching at the university, I earned my PhD in Cognitive Systems Engineering. Although there have been slight variations in the exact definition, one has been of uh, uh, safety culture, one that has been used for years, uh, decades even, are shared beliefs, assumptions, and norms which may govern organizational decision making as well as individual and group attitudes about safety. An incorrect understanding of safety culture is that it is commonly referred to as a single concept but rather it consists of four individual specific components, whereas each one provides its own unique actions to the overall concept of safety culture. And without one of these, the element and structure of culture will fall apart. As such, each serves the greater goal of providing a robust, effective, and well-proven safety tool for all high-risk industries especially given its proven value in aerospace industries. It should be made clear this culture concept is not only for airline operations, but rather any aerospace operation where risk of injury or death is a possibility to employees and or customer after product delivery. This is extremely important in determining an organization's overall safety culture as they, are all, as they all complement each other. To be successful, organizations may not simply choose simply one or two of these components because they are less expensive or more manageable. In addition, in aerospace, not following all four components of a safety culture or just the ones that have less impact, thus to appear to regulators or shareholders that they are being responsive finally and expeditious is not acceptable. This type of action will produce a non-viable, misleading, and potentially dangerous safety culture that will teeter on failure and provide a false sense of security. Let me be clear. When you try to increase productivity without the needed resources and being guided by poor management with only financial focus, and the lack of assembly line inspectors, you are always borrowing from safety. You cannot have both. And case in point, this is where we see events like the door blowout with Alaska Airlines. <laughs> NASA learned the hard way many decades ago and other organizations, aerospace organizations have as well, with their new plan to operate when they decided they were gonna operate faster, better, and cheaper and it failed horribly. They learned that you can only have two of the three, never all three at the same time, or accidents will happen. When we examine these four components of what constructs a safety culture, it appears that Boeing has none of them under control, and there is no evidence that this trend is in fact reversing. 
This was discussed at the Huntington Beach Conference in February at 2023, which I attended, but there does not appear to be any evidence of such changes to any of the components uh, on the horizon as a string of alarming events continue to unfold. In the safety engineering work, we call these precursors to accidents. And I have never in my decades of aerospace safety work seen so many continuing to arrive one after another. Where is the safety accountability all the way to the CEO where they discuss safety in addition to the money problems, all the way to the top. Some of these companies profess to practice, yet never seem to do that. All safety cultures, both uh, those that have and profess to have a good safety culture and SMS programs were developed by the FA and provide guidance how to do that. At Boeing, is there safety accountability all the way to the top? This was discussed after the, the previous accidents, but where's the evidence for that? In closing, you would think that there would have been made clear after having been directly responsible for the two air carrier fatal accidents that at its core causation was 100% about money and about sneaking through the certification process and automation related component, component that killed 346 people over money. And yet, we still have no proof that these programs have even entered the lexicon of Boeing. Aircraft, despite the hollow comments to the contrary at the Huntington Beach Safety Conference. So it leaves me to wonder, have we even gone backwards at Boeing? The Alaska Airlines event strongly supports that. My final comment is, is I have always felt as an accident investigator for over 20 years, and I've always said that, with these accidents, maybe the upper management should actually go to these accident scenes and witness what they look like, as, as the rest of us do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Pajinski. I would be happy to talk to you after this hearing is done. If you. I want to spare you being removed and just tell you that we will be happy to take those documents and meet with you privately. And we welcome your being here. We also welcome the presence of Chris and Clarice Moore, uh, whose daughter Danielle died in the Ethiopia <laughs> Airlines crash. Uh, they remind us that the seemingly abstract, even antiseptic setting of this hearing belies the fact that there are real people who perished in those two crashes. There are real people at risk getting on airlines right now. No reason to panic, but a reason for deep concern. And we thank everyone who may have documents or information to bring to our attention. We thank you. Uh, Professor Brzezinski, what keeps ringing in my ears is that phrase, 100% about money. My understanding of, about what happened here is that Boeing sought to produce more airplanes more quickly without the necessary testing, inspections, and then sought to conceal and cover up what it knew was happening. Is that align with your view of the facts here? Absolutely. That's, that, in fact, is part of it because those things are expensive. And, and, and there's more to it. There, there's other things that go into that process. One of the biggest is the inspectors. Cutting back and getting rid of your inspector um, staff that looks at all the parts to make sure that these things are assembled correctly. We saw this with the accident, with the Alaska accident. One of the lessons here is that shortchanging safety with shortcuts is short-sighted. I want to ask uh, Mr. Salapur uh, for many of us who may not understand the technology or the mechanics here, uh, my understanding of your testimony is that Boeing, in effect, fastened parts of the fuselage, T-38 
together using force rather than proper shimming and thereby created a severe risk that use over time and fatigue of the parts and fasteners would create risks to safety. Is that roughly correct? Yes, sir. I think they have used, they are using significant excessive force to squash the gaps before you measure it. If you squash in the gap before you measure it, you know, you don't know what you get in because the purpose of that is to measure the gap in its free state. When you squash that with excessive force, basically you're getting false information. If you get the gap measured falsely, you are not going to shim it properly, and it's a danger to the airplane. It's very, very important. Boeing has put out reports that they say that they can lose almost 80% of the airplane life cycle if we don't follow these protocols, which it is the proper shimming, you know, measuring the gap, you know, the one, one remedy yeah. or one precaution would be proper testing. Has Boeing ever shown you conclusive testing results that would dispel your concerns? No, sir. First of all, the testing that we're talking about, I have never seen it, any of the information. The second is the airplane is the king. The numbers that you get from the actual airplanes, regardless of what the testing done, that should be considered. And my data that I was using in my assessment is from the 29 airplane that it was inspected. Mr. Pearson and Mr. Jacobson, you have very extensive experience with Boeing. Well, their safety do the allegations that Mr. Salapor has brought to our attention surprise you in light of your experience? Well, I just want to say that I can't obviously technically, um, you know, say that what he's saying is absolutely right. I just don't know that. But I will say that the, the, the uh, problem that he's describing where he's trying to uh, get information and he's basically being told, you know, basically shut up, don't worry about it. And you know, he's, he's obviously making an effort a long effort to try to get to the truth. And what should happen is somebody should say, here's the data, here's the information. He shouldn't have to wait until becoming a whistleblower to get that information. Mr. Uh, Jacobson, uh, you worked at the FAA for quite a while. Mr. Pearson and as well Mr. Salapur have been critical, as many of us have been, of the FAA. Uh, in fact, Mr. Pearson has brought to the attention of federal authorities information about the potential failings of those investigative steps by federal agencies. Uh, do you think just assigning more inspectors to Boeing from the FAA is a sufficient solution? Well, certainly um, having more uh, inspectors is helpful in certain circumstances. I think. Um, in the, in the Renton factory, having more inspectors, uh, more of an on-site presence is very important. Uh, but the attitude needs to change. Um, the attitude right now is Boeing dictates to the FAA, uh, tells the FAA what they will do, what they will accept, and that needs to change. Uh, the FAA needs to be a regulator. Uh, they need to do their job, and, th and that's the missing piece right now. Would it be fair to say that the FAA has been too captive to Boeing. They, they absolutely have been too captive to Boeing. Um, and, and that is one of, the, one of the big problems that I've seen. Even when we were trying to recertify the 737 MAX, um, Boeing would try and focus the attention on certain things like MCAS to the exclusion of other uh, parts of the airplane or the design or the manufacturing that needed to be investigated. And, and Boeing or, and the FAA went along with that at high levels. They went along with that, you know, the, the redirect from, from the Boeing company. Uh, Mr. Salapur, I showed you earlier a photograph of a tire wheel from your car. Uh, that bolt was inserted by someone as a threat perhaps as a risk to you. Yes, I was losing just air on my tire, and I bring it somewhere, and they say, hey, you have a nail in tire. That's about one month old tire. So I brought it back to the shop that they fixed it. 
and uh, they fixed it. I went to pick it up, and the gentleman told me that, you know, this nail was not picked up through normal driving. You know, I didn't know anything about that. He's the one who brought it to my attention. And I came home, and I had to go all the way back there to get the tire, to just save the tire. It was like 25-mile drive, but anyway. But the bottom line is that, yes, the nail was inserted in there. I believe it happened at work. I have no proof of that. You mentioned also a threat to your physical safety. Someone saying they yes, would kill someone, you if they Yes, someone heard. told me they're going to kill. They would have killed someone like me if you said something, what you said. So, uh, the FAA issued an absolutely scathing report about Boeing, and Boeing has said that it's developing an action plan. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Pearson, should we rely on Boeing? to, in effect, develop its own action plan, evaluate itself, and go on about its business? Or do we need continuing investigation? We absolutely need continuing investigation. And honestly, I'm so tired of hearing about plans. We need action. And, and you know, you can plan all day long, but if you don't actually carry through with it, it doesn't matter. You'd like to see action? Yes, sir. I think that's one of the common themes here. We need action not just more talk. I'm going to uh, yield at this point. We're observing a seven-minute round, and uh, we're going to try to stick to it. Uh, Senator Johnson. So l let me point out, I think it's the 800-pound grill in the room is the tremendous pressure society-wide to keep these planes flying. I mean, if, if we were to literally ground stop 737s, what, what, what would happen to our economy? That's Again, that's why we don't even like contemplating that reality. But I want to start focusing on the 737 because that's the one issue. You've got the 787, then you have the, the subcontractors, from my standpoint, the three, and then the overall culture of, of Boeing. But th there's a discrepancy between uh, our two witnesses here. <clears throat> Mr. Pearson, you're, you're, you were saying that it's, it was a manufacturing defect. And Mr. Jacobson, you're focusing on the MCAS, which is what the public was all told. It was that control system. And with, with only a single indicator that if that went defective. Uh, so, again, th that was the story told. What is the truth? I mean, Mr. We'll start with you, Mr. Jacobson. Well, the truth is it's, it's more than one thing, right? It's, it's the entire system. You have to look at manufacturing. You have to look at um, also at the design. Um, since the MAX has gone back into service, th this is the list of manufacturing. These are unsafe conditions that are identified by the FAA in the manufacturing area. Um, engine anti-ice, exhaust duct, duct fasteners, compromised seal and adhesion within the center fuel tank, loose bolts in the rudder assembly, stuck rudder pedals, misinstalled electrical wire, wire bundles in the wing spoilers, and then of course the door blowout was also a manufacturing defect. So we have a long list of unsafe conditions from manufacturing defects, we also have a long list, equally long list, of design defects. So what that tells me is um, it's a company-wide problem. It's not So the, the MAX was taken out of service for how long? Quite it was some time, right? 20 months. 20, 20 months. And again, the public, you know, I was certainly hoping, assuming that that 20 months uh, they were able to correct those defects, that they did install more of the indicators, right? So they... they somewhat fix that problem? I mean, are all these other problems completely unaddressed, not well, there, fixed? There, there were many problems that were unaddressed. The crew alerting system is, is the big one. Um, that one was not addressed. That contributed to the crashes. The pilots had a lot of uh, false indications going off, which delays their response, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, in the meantime, you know, um, the stabilizer is running and the, the nose is running down. So um, it's, it's a combination of so things that need to be let, let, addressed. Let, what, what do the pilots had to say about this? I mean, one of my things that comfort me is that, you know, pilots are concerned about safety. They're, they do some safety checks even before they get on the airplane, but they're the ones that have to fly these things. They're, they're, what do pilots have to say about the 737 MAX right now? Well, um, you know, I, I've heard some reports. Um, you know, Dennis Tazier has been very vocal. He's an American Airlines MAX pilot. 
uh, also works with us at the Foundation for Aviation Safety. He's been very vocal about the shortcomings of the MAX. Um, does he fly them? He does. So and, he and he still flies them? He still flies them, and he says, why is Boeing putting all these extra hazards into my cockpit? Uh, it's a big enough job to, to fly this airplane and take care of the passengers in the back. I don't need extra problems to be dealing with, like manufacturing defects, design defects, and they're one after another. There's a long list that I've put in my written Mr. Pearson, do you have anything to add to that on the 737? No, I, I totally agree with Mr. Jacobson. Um, you know, when they investigated the accidents, they narrowly scoped it and they kept it very tight. And as an example of that, um, when the plane was returned to service, the MAX airplanes were returned to service, they um, said that they fixed the MCAS software and they provided the pilots the training that they needed. And then they said, we fixed some wiring, um, but it was unrelated to the accidents. Well, a couple months ago, we, we found the service bulletin that was sent out to the airlines to fix some wiring. That document was 343 pages long. It identified at least 12 areas on the airplane that had improper electrical insulation. And I will tell you that when those planes were being built, we were having repeat problems getting our functional testing done correctly. And this is something that we continued to push and push and push the planes out the door, and we were having difficulty getting our aircraft systems testing. What people don't know, and I'll just give you a couple of examples very quickly, is in the Lion airplane, that sensor, that angle of attack sensor, was removed the day before, replaced with the refurbished sensor. On the next flight, the plane almost crashed. On the next flight, it did crash. When that plane hit the ocean, it went right to, into the seawall. They never recovered that sensor that was just installed but they had the original Boeing installed sensor and they tested that sensor and it had an open circuit in it. It had evidence of arcing and burn marks. And so that, um, that is an example. And then okay, this, I'm, and the, I'm, I'm, I'm just that, pointing that out. That it, this it's is, getting, that's getting a level of detail right now. I don't have, I'm okay. fine, appreciate that. Um, again, I, I'll, I'll keep, this shows you Mr. Chairman what we need to get the airlines in here whether they want to or not, they have to come in here and talk about what they're doing in response to these technical bulletins. We need to get pilots in here. We need, we need to talk to pilots, because from my standpoint, they're almost the last line in, of defense in terms of safety from, from the flying public, because they're on that, I, I would never get on a plane that's autonomous, never. Sen Senator, I just, I echo what you're saying, but I think we also need to broaden that aperture. We need to talk to the mechanics and oh, the I technicians agree. and all those individuals. No, again, yes, as, you, as you said in your testimony, five, five minutes testimony doesn't even, be able to even begin to scratch the surface. Hour and a half hearing doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. This, that's why I said. This needs to be an in-depth investigation. There's a lot of elements to this thing. Uh, in preparing for this, I, I did listen to one NBC News report, and the, this is on the 787 on this gap, and they, they were reporting that, that Boeing had apparently stress-tested a plane, 165,000 takeoffs and landings, which is three times normal life. They inspected 689 of the 1,100 planes that are in service, zero evidence of fatigue. So how am I supposed to interpret that? Well, I think Boeing tries to put a lot of uh, misinformation out there. The problem is that 165,000 was on the original airplane. It did not see the excessive forces that we're talking about. If you haven't done the excessive force on those planes, they just thrown that out there to muddy up the water so that information is so clogged up that they are not. You know, they're saying they've done 40,000 tests or whatever. You know, did they put the information out there under what circumstances, what airplanes, what was the situation? None of that is shared. I have asked Mrs. Fall, you know, Lisa Fall, that it was on that thing two months ago, three months ago, when I met her, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to complain. I'm complaining to her about the 787. She said, I'll have somebody get you the information. You probably haven't seen the information. I have not seen any information whatsoever. Okay. As a matter of fact, you know, like they're just throwing that stuff. If you want to change the information, like the 165,000, then you need to rerun that test with 165,000, with the new excessive force, and show that it's good. Yeah, you got to show you. Or just one, one quick question for Mr. Pearson. You said you had uh, uh, delivered records to the FBI. First of all, how did you, how did you uh, obtain those records? 
And have you heard back from the FBI? The records were sent to me. Um, and from, from an internal whistleblower? From an internal whistleblower. And I provided those records to the FBI. And again, you know, for the last couple months, there's been, you know, talk that there's, there's no records. And that's and, and obviously this, not This is on the Alaskan Airlines This is on the Alaska that, Airlines. That, that Boeing apparently overwrote the video that would have shown, again, I, I've talked to Boeing. They said that's just normal. It's a 30-day cycle. And it's mainly, it's not really, the video is not there to document the maintenance would really document other things potentially, but it's overwritten regularly. Yeah, I'm talking about the actual documentation that they've been saying has not been available. It is available. It is available in the FBI. And, it, ha has and it has been available for months. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, uh, Senator Johnson. We're going to go to uh, Senator Marshall, then Senator Hassan, and Senator Hawley. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Salapur, you've described several significant events since you came forward with your claims. One was the nail in the tire. You described your life was being threatened. Do you feel that this style of retaliation against you has been part of Boeing's efforts to silence and prevent you from sharing your story? I think the retaliation, somebody even was calling me on my personal phone, you know, time after time. You know, this is my personal phone, you know. Well, what were they saying or... Well, my boss was calling me there, and uh, for 40 minutes, he kind of berated me and chewed me out. I have a work phone that he can use, but he's calling you on your personal phone, and it reminds me of, you know, people who they stalk people or something like that. They call you on your personal phone to let you know that they know where you live, they know where you are, and they can hurt you. And, you know, after the threats and after this, you know, it's like, you know, it really scares me. Believe me, but I am at peace. You know, if something happens to me, I am at peace because I feel like by coming forward, I will be saving a lot of lives and I'm at peace. Whatever happens, it happens. Well, we certainly do appreciate you, you coming forward and, and certainly the brave and, and courage it takes for all of you to do this. Yeah. Do you think that there was a culture of retaliation against whistleblowers at Boeing? It, Absolutely. And also, there is a culture of when you address the quality issues, and that's all I have done. I haven't made it personal. All I've done is said, hey, you know, we are not measuring the gaps properly. We are not shimming the gaps properly. Then, you know, you get threat threatened and this and that. All I'm trying to say is that system needs to be changed. Do you still have your job? I have my job. The only reason I have my job because... I had my attorneys, we filed for the whistleblower system before I spoke up this time. What's it like when you go back to work? Well, uh, last time, if you can think of it, I went to a meeting on the 777 and I brought up my concern in that meeting to say that the way we build in that airplane, it does not uh, correlate to what the design of the airplane is. Because of that, we are resulting in a lot of misfares, you know, uh, misfares and a lot of problems. You know, after 300 plus airplanes, we should be able to make that airplane. And uh, my boss sent somebody to the meeting, pulled me out of the meeting and uh, called me on the phone and says, I throw the person under the bus by asking the question, what are we doing to make our design compatible with our build system to overcome these you know, mislocated holes and this and that. And then he says, what was that, my intention? You know, and uh, really braided me. And a week later, he was going to talk about that again. I thought, you know, it's, it's resolved. But a week later, he was talking to me about that. You know, why should you even be pr prosecuted for something that, you know, all you're doing is saying, hey, the design that we used to have, we went to determine an assembly, right. it's not working. What so, can we do? Have you guys thought about anything to bring that so that they are compatible? So you, your intention was to build a safe airplane? Absolutely. Yeah. Not with force. <laughs> I, I want to try to understand this uh, okay. the diagram that you all yeah. supplied us. This is a Boeing 787. 7, 7. Yes. And you're talking about where these joints come together. Yes. I'm talking about the one on the fo most forward between, yeah, right there, and one in the aft. 
that's a 4143. No, the one this way. This yeah, one, right. Between that, that one. and the, the nose. That's a 4143. It's a major joint. And then one on the aft So in, instead of shimming them, they're basically just using force to bring them together. And you're Absolutely. concerned that it hurts the composite. Well, it, and it just violates every one of our common practices. Okay. Because you don't force the stuff together. Because when you force the stuff together, you increase the stress concentration right. on that. If you think, think of a paper clip, if you bend it back Get and it. forth, after a little while, it breaks. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of, of action, that's what I want to talk next about is, is action. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with NIAR at Wichita State University, the National Institute of Aviation Research. They specialize in aerospace R&D, including composite advanced materials, and they do wind tunnel, t wind tunnel testing, where they would take an entire wing, an entire fuselage from a plane like this and stress test it. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, would you, do you feel like that type of stress? To, I want to get the, we, we have different opinions, but that's where I would have confidence, and America would have confidence if there was stress testing, take some of these randomly and, and do that stress testing, or maybe it's already been done, I don't know. Well, I'm not a structure specialist, um, so I, I can't really comment on the, on the details of any of those sort of, um, you know, hypotheticals. But, I mean, in general, um, all of this, there's, there's design, then there's testing, there's, there's quite a process, and you can't violate any part of that process. If you violate... Um, okay, yeah. Thank, I'm sorry, but is anybody else familiar with NIOR and that type of stress testing where you put them in, do wind tunnel testing on these? I, I just think that that's the action that I would have confidence in as a scientist who have tested thousands of jets and airplanes uh, and are experts in composite to see exactly if this is a a challenge or not, I think that would be a great, a great uh, answer to this question. That's action. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Salford. One, one thing that I want to, you know, the issue that we're talking about is pressurizing the fuselage from the inside. Okay. You know, when you pressurize and depressurize, basically, you know, that's, we call a flight cycle. Every time you go up and you come down, that's one flight I'm cycle. I'm sure that we can reproduce that at NIAR. So I think it's a great, great yeah. point, though. And yeah. lastly, my last question is, it feels like the FAA and the DOT has dropped the ball as well here, though. M Mr. Pearson, go ahead. And, th and this the, is the action. The, I'm sorry, the, it was the DOT and the... And FAA. The, uh, uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, people don't understand. The FAA is a subordinate agency to the Department of Transportation. And as the FAA has been struggling with re revolving leadership and everything else, there's been numerous opportunities for the Department of Transportation to get involved and engaged. And what we've seen from them is nothing. They just kind of are on the sidelines. So, so to me, the action would be to ask the staff to sit down with the FAA and the DOT and the people and, and, and some type of report. We can't bring them in here for another six-hour hearing, but I would love to see a little bit more report on, on how they would defend themselves. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator, if I could just add, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt, but um, we met with the head of the FAA and the, and the deputy of uh, Secretary of Transportation in, in March 8th our foundation did, and we met with them, and we went through 35 um, problems, and we made recommendations to each one, and we said we offered to assist whatever we could because we want them to be successful. Um, but th they need to get in the game is all I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Marshall. Uh, I might just point out we've been in touch with the FAA. We hope that they will appear at a hearing as well, and they've issued a scathing report detailing the findings of an expert panel review of Boeing's management practices. Uh, the panel found, for example, quote, a lack of awareness of safety-related metrics at all levels of the organization, end quote. So I'm hoping that the FAA will be cooperative and aggressive in our continuing investigation as well, uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much, Chair Blumenthal and Ranking Member Johnson uh, for holding the hearing today. Uh, thank you to all of our witnesses for appearing today, uh, as well as your commitment to aviation safety and protecting the public. Uh, to Chris and Clarice Moore, um, thank you for being here. I am so sorry for your loss. Um, the picture of your daughter is a reminder of 
the reason we're here today and why aviation safety is so important. So thank you for being here. Um, and to Mr. Salapur, you mentioned in your testimony, as I understand it, that the Challenger disaster was a wake-up call as, and an example of why safety is so important. The teacher who was lost in that disaster was Krista McAuliffe from Concord, New Hampshire, and her loss is still felt today, as is her example. Uh, so um, thank you for um, invoking her memory today. Uh, and I wanted to start with a question to you, Mr. Salapur, and apologies if some of this has been covered uh, because we are in and out, but um, as a whistleblower, you raised two safety concerns regarding quality controls during the manufacturing and assembly process. Can you describe the internal Boeing culture around reporting safety and quality concerns? Right now, basically, you know, I have very, I guess, negative attitude towards the quality concern. You know, when I bring something to my boss to say, you know, we have problems with this, and he prevents me from even documenting and prevents me from even sending the information to the Shmi's, you know, the subject matters experts, to me that's a problem. Yeah. You know, a quality manager telling you not to write your concerns right. and not to send it to the uh, you know, the subject matter expert to just, let's say, you know, I'm, I don't know for sure. You know, they, they close a gap of like three quarters of an inch without shim. You know, right. that's concerning. Yeah. Our r rules are zero one zero, oh. So I said, you know, I want to write that. Well, don't send it. So not only were you discouraged and really told not to document it, What's your impression of how comfortable other Boeing personnel are with raising their concerns to management, both before and after you came forward? Well, I think it's very negative. It's, it's really, they think that, you know, like we had a situation where they had debris in the, in the gap, yep. and my, my friend put some inspections in there, and the, the boss was telling them that, you know, are you trying to stop the production? You know, those are significant problems that, you know, if you don't inspect, you have to inspect to get a good quality airplanes out. Right. And what I'm trying to say is the attitude at Boeing from the highest level is just to push the defective parts regardless of what it is, unfortunately. So what you're really saying is if, so from the top down, people are discouraged from coming forward. Uh, and so people are quite reluctant um, to come forward I in this culture. Absolutely. And, you know, the fact that I asked for the data from, I, I complained to Mrs. Fall, you know, and uh, she said she'll have somebody send me the information on 787. To this date, I haven't received any. Okay. So uh, another question for you, sir. In 2020, Congress reformed safety and certification requirements for aircraft manufacturers following the 737 MAX disasters. What was your experience with how those reforms were implemented and whether Boeing appropriately followed them? My personal opinion from what I've seen from bottom up, it's been nothing. Okay. And Mr. Jacobson, as a former FAA official, do you have any thoughts about how effective that agency was in implementing and overseeing those reforms? The attitude from day one was, was not good at upper levels of the FAA. The message that I heard right after AXA was passed was, uh, we're already doing all of this. So that's the wrong attitude from day one. Mm -hmm. And then what I saw, I tracked a lot of the implementation of AXA, um, working with Senator Cantwell's office. And what I saw there was um, kind of a half-hearted, uh, look at all of these recommendations and, and requirements. Um, they tended to lump them all together yeah. and called them work streams and said, we've got that covered. That's in this work stream or that work stream. And instead of taking each individual provision very seriously and attacking them, that, that was not the attitude. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question to both Mr. Pearson and then again to Mr. Jacobson. You both raised concerns about the 737 MAX, one of you directly with Boeing and the other with the FAA. 
Given the safety failures that have led us to this hearing, how can Congress better empower whistleblowers, protect them from retaliation, and reestablish a willing adherence to safety standards? So we'll start with you, Mr. Pearson. As I said, Senator, um, you know, we really shouldn't have to rely on whistleblowers. But with that said, I think that uh, all these um, programs need to have much more oversight because what happens, for example, at right now, if a Boeing employee wants to submit a whistleblower report to the FAA, they submit a hotline report. And those hotline reports go in, and then it could take months, potentially, for them to investigate it. And sometimes we've been told that uh, they don't, employees don't really know what happened. And so I think that there's a lot more, it needs to be a lot more attention. And, and again, I, I think what we need to talk about is leadership at all levels, uh, not just at the senior leader level, but even at the very frontline level, we need to treat people with respect and we need to value these employees. And I think that will help a long way. I, I think we're not providing enough training to these employees. I know that in the factory and we're putting individuals in responsible jobs and they need a lot more training. And I think that will help a long way of preventing having to use whistleblowers. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Yeah, I'm hopeful that uh, Mr. Whitaker, the new FAA administrator, will, will really take on the challenge of changing the culture at the FAA so that FAA is back to doing their job as a regulator. Um, if, if they just rubber stamp everything that the, you know, the manufacturers do, then it's really, um, they're not doing anything useful. And so we need to get back to them doing a useful job as regulators. Thank you for that. And um, Dr. Prusznicki, I have a question for you, but I am out of time, so I will submit it for the record. I'm just really looking for your recommendations about how to eliminate these grave safety risks. So we'll submit that for the record. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Hassan. Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for convening this hearing. Thanks to each of the witnesses for being here. Mr. Salapur, let me just start with you. I just want to back up and make sure I understand your testimony, because it seems extraordinary to me. And I'm reading the letters that you've submitted from your attorney when you first contacted uh, the FAA, when you contacted the committee. So my understanding is you worked on both the 787 and the 777, correct? Yes, sir. And you identified major safety concerns with both of these lines. So yes, sir. And you, identify, you identified these to your superiors. Yes, sir. I have written many memos time after time that we ha we can provide. Over a period of years, I think. Uh, yeah, this is like three years. For the 777, I mean 787, it's been three years of effort. And so your concerns, how who knew about your concerns? How far up the, the chain do you know that they went? I have gone as high as Mark Stockton and Lisa Fall, who is the vice president. The vice president of the company? So they, they were and are aware of, of these major safety concerns. And this is, what, this is what you do for a living. I mean, you're, you're an engineer, right? I mean, I'm an engineer. I went to quality about three, four years ago. And when you put your quality hat, we are the eyes and ears of the public for the safety of the airplane. That's how I feel about our job. And so I have, you know, when I see concerning information or concerning uh, uh, um, let's say, production issues, then it is our responsibility to make sure that, you know, if we are causing the airplane to have increased risk factors, our job is to eliminate those risk factors. It, are these planes safe? Right now, I would not. You know, it's like an earthquake. You know, it, the big earthquake is coming, but when... When that hits, the building that you know you, let's say if you're talking of a building, have to be prepared to uh, accommodate that type of a, let's say, shakeup. You know, it has to be built properly. Right now, from what I've seen, the airplanes are not being built per spec and per requirement. So you th your testimony is the 787 line and the 777, the 777 line, are, are you think are not. Or well, they, they are doing stuff that increases the risk factors, okay? When you increase the risk factors, you know, it's not just one. You are doing stress concentrations that those stress concentrations, like, you know, breaking a, a paper clip, you know, you do it once or twice. It doesn't break, but it breaks at some time. As the plane gets older, you know, all of these things that, you know, you took, you know, you said it's not a safety issue, it becomes a safety issue. And the company's response to you was to threaten you? Threaten you, sideline you, 
you know, transfer you. You raised concerns about the 787, and so they transferred you, transferred you to the 777, right? Well, in, yes. Initially, they just cut me off of all the meetings. Ah. They took my name out, and then so I was just doing nothing. I wasn't informed of what. Then they transferred me, and they do it pretty stealthy. Oh, we have a job over here. We want you to go over there. So they move you down there, and, you know, I come from, like, 40 years of engineering background. So when I see, pro and I've taken a lot of stress class, stress classes, even though I'm not a specialist on that, but when there's a problematic area that you see, you can recognize. So, so they, I just want to make sure I get the sequence right. So you raise these concerns. You get on the 787. You get transferred, or transferred over to the 777. You raise the concerns there. They ignore it in both. They, they haven't addressed any of these concerns. Is that your testimony? Yes, sir. And at one point, at some point, they start to threaten you. You're talking about your your boss calling you on your personal phone yeah. and, and berating you. And when did that start? Well, that started right after when I said, you know, we have made over 300 plus airplanes. We still don't know how to put the load and sell. What what I mean by that, you know, if you build in an airplane, I mean build in a house, it's like you know put in the foundation, you know. We have made over 300 airplanes. We're still changing our process, like build the foundation to put the airplanes. We are struggling with that because they have changed the process, you know, from stable to unstable situation. They're not building the, the same datums that we were building. So you're causing your own problem, but you don't want to admit it. Just force fit the problem you know, force fit the misaligned holes and everything else and move on. And that's what they have been doing. And that's what I have brought up to their attention. I told my boss that I said in the, in the report, I said, we have made 300 plus airplanes. That should have been more than adequate for us to resolve these things. All the problems that we've had, we put Band-Aid over Band-Aid to resolve the problems and Band-Aid over Band-Aid doesn't cover it. Maybe we need to consider some engineering fundamentals with a little bit of GDNT to figure out what the problem is. And right after that, he came back to my desk and he, he like I said, you know, he made the threat. And then after that, he says, are you in or are you out? What Meaning what? Are you in and are you out with Boeing? I mean, are you going to be a good good citizen and keep your mouth shut? Was well, that the implication? Well, that, that's how I can, I can interpret that. He would walk by me and he said, you better. Then he said, I want you to write it in writing. Tell me, are you in or are you out? Put we it have, in writing whether or not you were going to. I'm were gonna... in or out. And what that means, are you going to just shut up? Right. Well, that's only that would be I, in. If you wanted to be in, you needed to be quiet. You needed to stop this. You know, don't don't say anything more. Certainly, don't tell the public. Uh, that's how I interpreted. But he told me to write it in writing, and I'm trying to write it. And um, there was ten emails, just because I haven't received your email on this. Send it to me, and this and that. So then he's pressuring you. I mean, then he is to... pressuring you, and then. His manipulation even got further than that. You know, like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to take a class on my own time that I have to flex the time. He wouldn't let me do that. Oh. You know, I'm trying, I have a doctor's appointment. He cancels my doctor appointment at oh. the same day. I mean, you know, different, manipulating different behavior. things to retaliate, to make your life miserable. And then, you know, I started talking to go somewhere else. You know, I, I mean, you know, you... You, you just try to escape from that because this is hell, you know, that I was yes. subjected to. And then he threatens you with that. And uh, really, with my background, you know, I've had some, uh, um, you know, it it's really has made me where 3 o'clock in the morning I'm waking up with somebody stabbing me. You know, I'm still receiving psychological help to just get back on normal. Well, it, it is... It is unbelievable to me that in the midst of this safety crisis at this corporation, that what they're doing is threatening their own engineers, whose job it is to help identify potential safety concerns. And rather than saying, you know what, you've got a point, we need to maybe do something about this. They're telling you to hide it. They're reassigning you. They're threatening you. They're trying to shut you up. In the meantime, I noticed this guy, Dave Calhoun, I think he's the CEO. I guess he's leaving at the end of the year. I wonder how much he's getting paid. I bet it's a lot. Yes. I it's a it's, lot more than my pay grade. I bet it's a lot more than your paycheck. Yeah. I bet it's a heck of a lot. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you for, for holding this hearing. I, I think we're just scratching the surface here, but this is just, this is extraordinary. It's just extraordinary. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Giving uh, us the opportunity. Thank you very much, Senator Hawley. And again, I just want to say uh, 
I could not agree more with the points that have been made about the need for continuing investigation by our subcommittee, as well as by the FAA and the Department of Justice. Um, and I'm anticipating we'll have strong bipartisan consensus about the next steps that we will take. But uh, we're going to have a, another round of questioning. It's going to be short, shorter than I would like, because we have a deadline for being in our chairs in the United States Senate on the floor for a completely unrelated purpose. Uh, but I want to kind of begin where Senator Hawley ended. Mr. Salop, Mr. Salpour, uh, in your testimony, you told us that since 2021, multiple colleagues have told you about sharing your concerns. Most of them have not come forward. Why? It's the fear. I mean, if you think of how much problem I have created, you know, by coming up with my, you know, being persistent about talking about the defects and everything else. Ever since the space shuttle O-rings, that has really put a mark on me. That thing should not have happened, but it happened because of the faulty engineering. And that's exactly what we have here, is we have faulty engineering that, you know, they're trying to shove on our throats to just say, hey, you know, whatever we do, it's okay. From one side, they put reports that it says it's not okay. From the other side, when they violate it, they try to violate whitewash the influence. Whitewashing, and because, whitewashing, whitewashing the spec to say it's not important for this thing. You know, this spec, if we don't meet it, it's not that big of a deal. Let's just push the airplanes out. And then the, the, the attitude of the people for, like I said, you know, not being receptive, you know, because of the threats or anything else, be, that's because of that people haven't come forward. You know, you've been very careful in the way that you have phrased the potential danger here. You talked about the increased risk. Yes. One could compare it to something a little bit like Russian roulette. We never know exactly when it's going to happen, when or where or how it's going to happen, but fatigue building and the potential vulnerability of that fuselage to tearing apart is a risk that has been increased. And it's a risk that should never have been increased. Absolutely. And yet these processes are continuing, are they not? Yes, sir. From what I know, it's continuing. And right now, Boeing is coming back and really Remember, whatever they put out there, they say that you know, everything is okay because they never learn from their mistakes. That's what the really significant thing that I want to take from this is that they never learn. You know, it's like a lie. When you say one lie, you have to lie 10 more times to cover that lie. You know, hey, we made a mistake. Let's correct it and move on. But that's not what's happening. Um, you've referred to numerous memos that you've written. Uh, I have one of them, which is a 2021 memo. Uh, the recipient of it has been deleted, but the memo speaks volumes, in my view. And one part of it, one sentence, I think, is kind of a coda for the lesson that Boeing should have learned, and I'm quoting, kicking me out of the program because I am raising safety concerns over the unintended consequences of the increased fit-up forces and potential escapements as a result does not help anybody. It does not help anybody. It doesn't help Boeing. No. At all. And again, this focus on stock price, on quarterly profit, on money over safety is a bad investment. It is malpractice beyond simply a broken self safety culture. Uh, the, the expert panel 
of the FAA said something that I thought was uh, pretty telling, quote, a safety culture is not something that springs up ready-made from near-death experience. Rather, it emerges gradually from the persistent and successful application of practical and down-to-earth measures, like giving you a bonus for your courage and your insights, rather than, in effect, threatening and penalizing you. Yes, sir. Dr. Puchnicki, am I correct in that kind of observation about safety culture, that it has to be the result of persistent, step-by-step, down-to-earth actions by management that is really committed to safety, not just in word, but in deed, and it has to put its money where its mouth is. No, you're exactly right. Uh, and this is part of the four parts of a safety culture, that you do have these reward systems in place, and you are proud when people come forward like this, and you embrace that and you celebrate that. And there's many different ways you can do that. Uh, various companies can, can, can do this. But if, if I may take this time to just add one thing very quickly, is one part of a healthy safety culture is that the accountability goes all the way to the top of the, uh, of the company, all the way to the CEO. And when I go to help companies um, with their safety culture problems, I, I talk all to, to, to CEOs. And one of the questions I ask them is, how much time do you spend weekly with your safety department? Because different companies might spend time with their marketing people, their finance people, and, and all their money people. And what I find across the board is, they don't spend time with their safety people, yet they say they're accountable and they sign documents they're accountable. And most of the time they'll tell me, well, my, uh, this person meets with them or, or whomever. That is not accountability to the top. And I tell them that, well, if you have time to meet with marketing and your finance people, then you should have time to meet with your safety people weekly. And if I had time to talk to Boeing, I'd be fascinated to know how many times per week their CEO people actually talk to their safety people. That shows accountability. It would be an interesting answer to that question. So deans of business schools across the country and CEOs of corporations, big and small, are you listening? Will yeah. you take a lesson from Boeing's experience? Yeah, because if they're not doing this, they're wrong flat out, and we've seen this time and time again with accidents, and I go all over the world and I help companies straighten this out. It's flat out. I, I'm gonna yield to uh, Senator Johnson. So, so let me just underscore, you know, from my own manufacturing background, I think the key to a safety system, quality system is accountability. In you know, my little plastics manufacturing plant, every roll of plastic that went out had the operator's name on the name tag, on the roll tag. We, if that was rejected, we knew exactly who Produce that who approved it. And so, so accountability is, is crucial, which takes me back to the 737 MAX and the deferred prosecution agreement. First of all, I, I want some clarity. Was it or was it not the, the MCAS system that caused that crash? The MCAS system, uh, Senator, was obviously played a significant role, so did the lack of pilot training. But as Mr. Jacobson has said, there was other factors, and our analysis, my analysis, shows that those airplanes also had manufacturing defects that triggered the MCAS software. Mr. Jacobson? Yeah. So what were those other defects? I mean, was it the, the, the sensor? I mean, only having one sensor was part of that system, though, but... Well, the sensor... Um as, as Mr. Pearson has talked about, the sensor showed um, problems. The original sensor on the Lion Air airplane showed uh, a lot of manufacturing defects when it was examined. Um, what I found curious was after the Ethiopian crash, they said the sensor was taken off by a bird. They had no evidence for that, none whatsoever, but they concluded that it was the bird that did it. And so I... I think it's much more plausible and likely that it was a electrical fault of some t sort, either arcing or something like that. So of, of all the troubling testimony uh, that I've read here, leading up this hearing, what I've heard here today, uh, probably the most troubling is the fact that Boeing did not notify regulators of this significant change 
in the MCAS system. I mean, would you agree with that? I would. Um, I, I think the, both crashes would not have happened if they had been fully transparent and forthcoming with the design. Um, of, so we, of we, the come back, we come back to accountability. Yes. Has anybody been held accountable for concealing that from the FAA? I mean, 300 some lives were lost. And again, my condolences to those family members of those lives were lost. This, this was beyond negligence. Th this is an overt act. And nobody has been held accountable in any way, shape, or form, financially, losing their job, criminally held liable. Look, we've been dancing around an issue here that quite frankly, it, being a systems engineer, I design a lot of automation and the interaction between human and automation. And what they did is quite obvious. They snuck the MCAS system through the certification process, period. It's that simple. Is, it, and, it, and, is, and they, is, but they did that over money, it, sir. Is that or was that criminal? Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I, a, I I'm not a prosecutor. It. Is that is that criminal? Do we have laws on the books? That, I can't that, answer that type of That type of... Uh, I, I even, what's the right word? Not I know, evasion. I mean, is that, was that criminal behavior? Should it, somebody been held liable criminally? I can't answer if that's criminal, but as a cognitive engineer, I can tell, and I, and, I, and I know how the certification process works, and I know how this accident works. They snuck it through the process, and it was all about money. It was all about getting those airplanes to Southwest, and it was all about money, and that's why those people died. Has the deferred prosecution agreement being made public, or is that sealed? I, I'm not aware if it's been made it has, or not. It has been made public, uh, Senator, and it, it's an absolute, um, probably the most embarrassing thing in my career if I've seen is, is how those families were treated, and that deferred prosecution agreement should never have happened. It, it was absolutely criminal that they did that. It was, it was, it was just so, so, heart so, so who's in charge of that deferred that is, prosecution? That I mean, is, that who, is, who agreed to that? That's the Department of Justice uh, that Let agreed me just to that. intervene, since I am a former United States attorney and a federal prosecutor. Uh, the Department of Justice deferred prosecution agreement is public. In fact, I was very critical of it at the time it was reached. And I've urged since then that the Department of Justice investigate whether in fact it has been violated. And I think the ranking member raises a very pertinent and important question. Uh, Mr. Pearson has raised it as well. He's presented evidence that the Department of Justice should consider through the FBI. Uh, we have brought to the Department of Justice's attention evidence that should be considered. Uh, they're gonna have to make a judgment. We can't because we're not prosecutors, but accountability and, that, and, that's, and, and that is the reason I'm going down this line of questioning is accountability all along the process, you know, within the company, within the, their quality system, their top management, but then the FAA and then Department of Justice, when they see the evidence, not doing anything about it. And, and again, I'll, I'll go back to the reality of the fact that we all want Boeing to succeed, that, that we don't want to think that there are conditions in these planes that w should really force regulators to ground these planes, what that would do to our economy, what that would do to people's lives. I mean, that's, that's just a reality. It's an, off, it's an awful reality, but that's what we're all facing. I think that's what's driving the lack of accountability. People don't want to be held accountable because people don't want to take the actions that might be required here. I, 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 I think Senator, that's just an awful reality. I just want to emphasize again that the airlines play a huge role in this, right? They obviously want airplanes. They, they need airplanes to do their, you know, what they want to do. But they have a, a very much a um, responsibility to make sure those planes are safe. I'll just give you an example. We did an analysis and in Alaska Airplanes. We did it. We produced this. We published this thing in September 2023. They had 53 brand new MAX airplanes. We found over 1,200 aircraft system malfunction reports that they had submitted to the FAA, 1,200 on 53 brand new planes within two years old. And I'm not talking tray tables or headrests. I'm talking the systems that Mr. Jacobson has been talking about. So we need to make sure that those things are investigated and resolved, and, and they're which, supposed to be. Which is why I've reached out to the airlines. I've talked to a couple CEOs. Um, 
we need to talk to their pilots, we need to get their mechanics, we need all these people talking together. Uh, just individual hearings aren't going to do it. I mean, this, this requires a full-blown investigation with all these people being interviewed, uh, people feeling free they can come and they can come before us with whistleblower protection, either stay anonymous or provide whatever protection we can. Again, we need a lot of information. We need a lot of witnesses. We have an awful lot of information to uncover and discover here, a lot of truth to be exposed. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Let me uh, just conclude, and I would like to continue this hearing, but uh, Senator Johnson and I will be held accountable if we're not in our seats on the, on the floor of the United States Senate uh, before 1 p.m. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for being here for all the reasons that you know too well. You have taken risks throughout your career, every one of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, my, my colleague for his very understandably passionate and insightful comments, which I share about the need for accountability as a prosecutor. Accountability is about deterrence. It is about teaching lessons with real consequences for intentional mistakes and wrongdoing. And uh, I'm hopeful that we will be in touch with the Department of Justice to indicate our interest in cooperating with them. And in the meantime, uh, this record will remain open for 15 days for other questions that may be submitted in writing, and also documents that may be submitted by others. Uh, and we hope uh, that there will be others who will come forward. So uh, thank you all for being here today. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>